Hey everybody, welcome to the Brooks McDonald Show. We're excited to come at you again today uh, with another episode. I got my beautiful wife, Carrie Beth, here. Hey everybody. And uh, we are just, we love chatting with you about life and experiences. And today we want to talk a little bit more about uh, the experience we had for our 15 weeks in an RV uh, and what that was, what prompted us to be that way. We get a lot of questions about it. I think there's a lot of you that are interested in learning more about that process and, and how that all uh goes and how did we make those decisions and how much did it cost. So we're going to get down in the weeds a little bit on some numbers. We're going to talk about where we went, why we went there. What did we learn from it? Because if anything, I'm hoping you can just walk away from this with some um, tangible ideas and say, whoa, I didn't know that I need to think about that when I'm planning my family trip for however many weeks um, in an RV. So is that fair? Yeah, totally. So it was back in 2020, uh, you know, catching you up. We had decided we wanted to travel with our kids. Our daughter was eight at the time. Our son was 10, almost 11. And we just wanted to let them see life in the world with us while they were still young. And so we were trying to figure out what to do with that. We were wanting to go do Europe for a while, but that happened to be right as COVID came upon the world and absolute insanity broke out. Um, so we said, well, maybe we could look at like RV life. Like literally that was the decision making we had uh, was, well, let's look at RVs. I had never owned an RV before. Carrie Beth's like parents maybe had a pop-up camper. <laughs> totally. Is that fair? <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> when you were little, um, but my, my family never had one. We had like a little fifth wheel that we camped in for deer hunting, but it was stationary. We never pulled it anywhere. So no experience, like disclaim that when we started this experience. Like, so if you're sitting there thinking, well, at least they had all this experience, we didn't have any. You just got to go figure it out, right? That's a lot of our life. Yeah. So that's actually the first thing I want to say is if you are listening to this and you see the title of this episode and you're like, yeah, I want to know about this. If you're even thinking about this, you should totally do it. We had no, basically no research other than like, hey, what would work for our family to yeah. get, we go out of town on another trip before we had the RV here in Florida, and we just found one. We didn't know anything about it. So all that to say, you don't need experience, but we hope we can tell you a few things today that will prepare you a little bit if you're looking into doing this. So today we're going to dive in a little bit to the cost, to the why, to the how. You know, we had ch children along with this. And um, so, yeah, we just want to give you some info and help you decide if this is a good idea. And it totally is. Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. And so, uh, kind of as we started out, I, I think I can kind of, as we sit here and talk about it, it's coming back to me. And I can think back on when, when we were looking at RVs, what type were we going to get? Because at first, what I really wanted was like one of those Sprinter vans that were like tricked out. That's when I first go at it. I didn't know anything about it. Literally, I just kept seeing the word Sp Mercedes Sprinter on the back of these like souped up vehicles. Now, from research and learning, I started learning what a class B RV is. You have A, B, and C in class RV, uh, classes in RVs. And really what I was thinking was, hey, I at the first part, I was like, I don't even care about sleeping in it. We'll sleep in a hotel. I just want a toilet on board so that I can drive for an extended period of time without the kids complaining, and probably have like a couch, maybe a TV, so that when we're putting in these long hours, especially out west, they could be doing something and I just have to be stopping all the time. That that was where it began, I remember. Is that fair? Yeah, <laughs> it is. And we also didn't know, like, as you're explaining to people that don't, if you didn't know anything about RVs like we did, that kind of seems like in the middle, right? A class B, A, yeah. B, and C. Yeah, that's right. But that's not true at all. Yeah. So the A's... Or yeah, the big yeah. boys. Yeah, A's are the big rigs. When you yeah. see the ones out on the road, look like tour buses, kind of. That's a class A. And then the little ones, actually, the little bitty vans that are really tight, like that are usually on what's a Mercedes Sprinter chassis that are built out by lots of companies, but they just use a Mercedes Sprinter chassis to build them. Those are B's. And then the class C's, as I like to affectionately refer to them, as the U-Haul vans. So you think like a U-Haul driving down the road, if you ever use one, it has grandma's attic up, up top where you stow stuff over the cab and the cab sits lower to the ground, that's a class C. And so as I looked at pricing, I realized, wait a second, A's are out. They're like 200000 and up. 
bees also were out because they were like 200,000. They're like 150, 200,000 and up. And at the time, I'm like, I can't, I can't spend that type of money. That's, that's not going to work for us. But I get into the class C's and I'm like, Bingo. wait a second, this <laughs> may work. So we start seeing these different types of brands. And honestly, like I, I just, if you know me, or let me tell you and part on you, if you don't know me, I'm not one that just like delve into deep research. I don't think either one of us really Neither are. Neither one of us have a detail. Like analysis, I actually even equate with analysis paralysis, where it keeps you from making decisions, uh, but to a fault. And so I'm like just looking a little bit of research, like what brands are out there, which ones are just junk, which ones are okay, and then honestly, which ones are in our price range. So, and what was available in yeah. 2020. Yeah, so down here in, in Florida, at the time we weren't full-time residents, so we didn't realize it yet. Uh, we were living in Nashville, but we had a house, a second home in Florida uh, that we also rented out for cash flow, and we were staying in it, and we were like, hey, let's go set off and tour Florida. So we drove all around Florida, literally all the way tracing down via Tampa, then down through the Keys, back up through Miami, Fort Lauderdale, up through West Palm Beach and um, Daytona Beach, New Smyrna Beach. We did all, oh we did we did Disney. Side note, we did Disney in COVID, and it was awesome. We had to wear the mask, which wasn't awesome, but it was like a private tour of Disney. Nobody no was one. there. Like if you were in Animal Kingdom and you wanted to do the Flight of the Banshee, is that right? The Flight of the Banshee. Yeah. Um, you would normally wait like an hour, an hour and a half for that, at least. Wait. And we would come off and the side door would be open and the worker would like, hey, you want to ride again? We literally walked through a side door and back on. It was cool. That was free. Um, but over around uh, Tampa, north of Tampa is like the mecca of RVs. So we stopped and we looked at different RVs and I'd seen, I'd been looking online and I realized, hey, I just... I don't really like buying from dealers a lot because I feel like I'm playing a dealer price tag just like a car. You know, as soon as you drive it off the lot, it loses value new. And so there were very few of those um, individually owned ones that were for sale, obviously more with dealerships just like cars. Um, And you don't know what you're getting into, but the Lord guided us and we were down in Tampa. Did we? I think we cut back across to Tampa from our trip. We were looking and we V-lined back over there. Yeah, I, I think we were like in Bradenton. This doesn't matter to most people, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we went and looked at this class CRV. It was a Jayco Greyhawk. And there was an um, a couple in like their 60s, 70s that owned it that had kind of driven it some. It had been kind of sitting up, which a lot of RVs are. People buy them and they sit and they don't do anything. And so you have to pay really close attention to things, which we'll get into. Don't want to get ahead of myself. And long story short, I think it was like seventy thousand dollars, roughly. Yeah, roughly. I want to say we pay about seven. It, that sixty eight was yeah. the number in my head. Pay about sixty eight thousand dollars for this, like at the time, three or four year old RV. Yeah, fair enough. But let me tell you, it didn't look three or four years old. So just know, like. We weren't going for top of the line when you hear what we had. Um, we were going for functional and like what would fit our family. And um, just by talking about this, like we clearly both are interested in doing it again. <laughs> um, and it was great. It was totally great for that time. But just know when we say a three or four year old RV that would sleep all of us, it was, um, what do we call it sometimes? <laughs> uh, rough. No, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it was... <laughs> You know, seventy thousand dollars for an RV yeah. that versus two hundred thousand dollars for a lot of the other ones. Like, you get what you pay for yeah. into some form or fashion. They were, I mean, you know, some of the seats were chipping, the flaking off, and um, but we were trying to figure out two sleeping arrangements. So, so you know, what I discovered with Class A's is even though they're bigger, most of them don't have very good sleeping quarters. They're mainly for like a souped up nice apartment for a. Um, snow uh, for empty nesters to yes. travel in. Big king size bed in the back, big living room, but very few had like bunks in the middle on the way through and everything. And I wanted one that could give us beds as much as possible. And so I liked that little area above the cab because typically there was a bed there and then you'd have a fold out couch. Class B's were definitely no go. You could not sleep four people in there anyway comfortable. You could, ooh, it would be rough. So we bought. This Jayco Greyhawk, um, and it's a 
middle of the line brand even like if you think of tiffin and some of these other brands that make really high quality uh, much much higher quality than i would say jayco was but the price point was there Okay, I just want to do a little funny side note into uh, our personalities and how we are, because this will help you. We buy this RV, didn't know when we left on the trip that we were going to buy this RV, to the point of we drive it off from these people, and we go, oh, where are we going to put this when we get home? Right? Like, we left there, had nowhere to store it. We knew we were going to do this trip, but it was still, I want to say, two months away at this point. And so we had to call around and find a place to store it. So we weren't prepared, but it worked out. Yeah. No, I mean, I remember, I guess, us driving it back. I forgot about that we didn't have a spot. But we found a place probably 40 minutes from our house. And it was like a in the middle of a sand lot. That Again, we'll get into pricing. And that's another piece that you have to consider is where is it going to be when you're not driving it? Because you're not driving it all the time, assumptively, unless you're full-timing it. Um, and then like, okay, how are we going to get around? So we start mapping out our our process, you know, where did we want to go first? And we all, like, especially with COVID, and, and we weren't sure, you know, the government made it seem like the world was ending quickly. So we wanted to be in places that were wide open spaces further away from people. So we decided to go out west into New England. Was that fair? Yes, uh, we did. We just did it. And some people were like, are y'all crazy? Like, what are you doing? Things are shut down. Being in an RV at that time, like in hindsight, was amazing because you didn't have to really go in and deal with hotels and deal with all the regulations. It was just us. And that's part of what we want to say about when you're deciding about, is this worth it for your family? Is that for us, we did, uh, I think, I don't know, seven or eight on that out West, the first trip. Yes, sorry, weeks. And it was like having your little house on wheels, right? So we would go everywhere and you would go out and explore, but then you would come back and it was like, having your same bed every night and having your clothes in the same drawer and having your shower tiny and interesting as it may be. But that was something that made it worth it for us as we were um, embarking on our. Yeah. Yeah. So we were trying to figure out first off, um, especially out West and with national parks and I may be skipping around on a list you have sweetie, but um, you know, one of the big pieces is, availability for RVs because in later in 2020, especially RVing became very popular in the parks. When we got there, we were not the original thinkers of let's go to parks in the U S during the summer. And so trying to find places for these RVs to be able to go is one thing I have to implore you on quickly. Like the biggest plan ahead you probably need to do is reserving a spot well in advance. As fair? a matter of fact, I've just looked up currently um, what those are and um, the ones that book up, um, way far in advance or near national parks, near or on even a national park. And so I just looked up availability around uh, Yellowstone National Park and just dig and search. Don't just look at the first one that you come to because there probably is something available um, and scroll all the way down. So here's another lesson. And you, every one of them, you're going to have to enter in what you have, what you're towing, how long your RV is. And then it'll give you these options, okay? Um, so the cheaper options are like a back-end spot where you have to back in your RV, right? Or there's a pull-through where you can just pull straight in and how... Um, what all you're available to hook up to, right? So you want water, you want sewer, all of those amenities, okay? Um, interestingly enough, when I just looked it up, the lower end, cheaper ones for Yellowstone, uh, you can't even go out far enough to get one. But if you pay a little bit more, there's some available in like May. So uh, that I feel like changes with the year, but that is the current status. Yeah. Yeah, so booking and where you're going to go, because what we decided to do is we, let's set out a map of where we're headed and how long do we think we're going to stay. And that was really kind of hard because you're like, okay, and that's how it became like eight weeks is we want to we don't want to go one night here, go to the next. For me, especially out west, that takes me to another note about out west is things are very far apart. There's a long drive stretch, especially when you, to get out to from where we were leaving from in Tennessee because we went to see family first, but from Florida, Tennessee, it's a long drive to get to like Jackson Hole in that area. And so you have to plan on, man, do I want 12-hour days 
um, you know, back to back. And what I learned, especially when we went to our second trip, is I do not want to drive, honestly, more than like four hours a day. But out there, you had to. Like a minimum long day would be like eight or nine mm-hmm. hour drive. I'd say minimums were eight. We did a lot of 12s out there. Yeah, a couple 12s. Mm-hmm. That was miserable. 12-hour <laughs> days behind the wheel. I did all the driving, and that just stunk. It just, your body ached. Your, I was so tense because you got to think you're pulling a rig that's not far off the length of an 18-wheeler because we towed our Jeep Wrangler, a two-door Jeep Wrangler behind it. And so all of that together and you're, it's, it's as wide as the lane is. So you do not have forgiveness uh, as you're moving and you cannot pull off in any gas station. Um, you'd have to find a big gas station like 18-wheelers go to typically so to fair. navigate and, and run it. Depending on where you are, California, just for a note, is much more difficult. Remember that? to find the bigger gas stations. Okay, let's organize ourselves. As we said, we don't have a lot of detail, but going back to the how, how are you doing this? So you're you if you want to do this, you probably know your why, right? You want to get out with your family. But the how, so we talked a little bit about charting where you'll go, okay? Um, we did a long trip out west, and then we did another one east, and we're going to talk about kind of the differences in those. However, um, another part of the how is if you have children, And you have a flexible work, right? Like Brooks has a staff person right now even, right? Like you think this just has to be business owners, but he is someone that just works uh, remotely and she's on the road all the time. So this can be done. And in saying that, but if you have children, right, they have to have some sort of school. So we did homeschool and we just homeschooled them virtually um, at the time through what's called Home Life Academy. Super easy. Um, And in all honesty, I have an education background. I... On our long travel days, which that was a perk about West, we had somewhere to be. We sat at the table. We did math and reading is what I focused on. And then we used our experiences in the national parks. And I bought all these little books and things to go with them um, to study about those. And it was just honestly one of the most beautiful ways to learn. So that is kind of a little more of the how. And then charting your courses, right? We misplaced. I'm ready for another one, right? But you look at what you want to do. And what kind of comes next, like drawing it on a map. And then you start to look at what's available. Yeah. And it made me just think about like when we say, how do you how do you put yourself in a place to do this and financially afford it? Uh, business owners are a good place. That was for me because I, had, I was in the driver's seat to scale the team where I needed to and have management where it needed to be because – in the insurance world, clients still have to be taken care of. They expect, you know, top-notch service. That doesn't mean they expect me to be the one to answer the questions, uh, answer the calls and such, but we had to have staff to do that. So that was a big deal for me. Sometimes you may have a flexible remote work job. Um, just be cautious about that and how you ask about it. Do you need to prepare yourself to be uh, extremely irreplaceable before you approach the owner about having that opportunity or Some of these guys like we met while we're out there, they just went into jobs that was 100% remote work anyways. But by no means do I um, try to tell you to slack on work if that's the expectation. You got to be willing to meet that work expectation. Another idea that I thought about is for us, because we lived, we decided to rent our Nashville house out for a 12-month renter. We had a second home beach rental and we were living in it, but we already had renters booked for summer. So while we were gone, actually, all our housing was was already covered. We had a full-time renter that was making profit in the Nashville house. And then we had, I mean, that's the money year time in a beach rental is May, June, July, and August. And so that's when we were out and gone. We were later into that period, right? But we still had some yeah, renters. Yeah, but we still had some renters. And so we truly, I mean, we weren't paying any of our normal housing was covered. And so we just were paying for the trip part of it, which if you can do that in today's world through Airbnb or wherever you're at, that yeah. makes it a lot more affordable. So I'm just thinking for you just to get creative, whether you're inland or in a town that doesn't have vacation rentals per se, um, usually most HOAs, the minimum allowable to have a lease if you can't do short-term rentals in your town or it's not in a spot to do it is six months. So you may look at doing a six-month period where you lease your house out and then that can help cash flow the travel expense of it. So just another fun idea, you know, um, and so you mapped, we mapped out our our route and where we wanted to go, estimating kind of how long it would be and when we would be where. Well, we had to actually, because we made reservations. So we tried to give ourselves some gap of like maybe in between, 
Glacier National Park up almost in the Canadian border all the way to um, around Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington. We don't know where we're going to stay in between those two places, and we'll figure that out on the way. That's kind of where hotels came along, but some of the bigger ones we already had reserved uh, yes. in the parks. Yes, and so I remember this. Some people would be like, well, where are you staying here or there? Pretty much what we had reserved when we left was national parks. Other than that, we would have some rough estimates, but you you can be flexible in an RV if you're not trying to stay right on a national park, okay? You can jump into a place. Um, we would jump into places along the way, like when we were doing travel days, and we would stop. Like he said, sometimes you would have to pull into a, a, a cheaper hotel and just park the RV. But um, I did just have those big places booked. Now, let's... Are we ready to get into numbers? Sure. Okay. So, let's talk numbers. Let's say you know where you want to go. You look, you get the things booked in advance. We both agree on this, that typically, for the most part, you're not really going to save money versus staying in a hotel. So, this is not something that we did and thought we're being so frugal, okay? So... I will talk about some ways you can do that, but for the most part, um, now we're not talking nice hotels, but your basic Hampton Inn, Holiday Inn, those things, you can do it for about the same price, just so you know. In rural America, yeah. Yes. But um, anyway, we still highly recommend it. So let's get into numbers. Okay, so here's your options. We, there are ways to do memberships, right? And so we were a part of what's called Thousand Trails. And while we don't want to knock anybody here on this podcast, it doesn't matter probably which one you have it up, right? Some are good. Some are, let's just call it not as good. <laughs> and um, you didn't know exactly what you were going to get, but it that does make it more affordable. You join these memberships and you've there's some rules around them where you could stay certain amounts of time, um, but we were we were members of Thousand Trails. And so we booked a lot of those were Thousand Trail campgrounds. And then I didn't, ha you didn't have to pay extra on top of that. Okay. So look at memberships, which ones are good. We stayed in some great ones from Thousand Trails. So I don't want to knock them. Just look into what it is. There's probably reviews. We're just not detail oriented. Okay. So look at that. I'm going to tell you that rentals per night in a campground go everywhere from, I'd say one of the cheapest we did was like $40 to $200, okay? And $40 was like totally fine. It was just like a paved area that you pulled up. We had hookups. It was great. It just was in a more rural area. Um, or on national parks, from what I just looked up, the high end, like having everything is about 150 a night. Um, the lower end is probably, I think, right around 100 And then the more expensive ones I've seen are actually right here where we live. Um, and those are like beachfront 200 ish, or maybe even more at this point, um, places. So that's kind of the estimate of what you're going to spend per night. So, as you can see, some of them you could get a hotel for that. Um, and then you just spread out the cost depending on what area you're in. Yeah. So, diving into that a little more is, and I think you're going to allude to saving some money, but just to clarify, kind of lingo is. When you're in an RV, when you first buy it, you're like, well, I can just stay in it. Why do I need anything? And so there's a big difference between what they call boondocking, which means if you pulled into a Walmart parking lot and self-sufficiently ran your rig, you got to have gas that's running, your generator's got to be running, um, that's going to power your air conditioning and your refrigerator and all that stuff. And then full partial hookup or full hookup RV parks. And so partial hookup may be they have water but no electricity. They have electricity but no water. That's partial, or they have both, oh, and sewer. There was a lot of places that would have, that was the big thing. A lot of RV parks expense is running that sewer line, and or in northern areas, that's a freezing hazard for them and such. So it may have power and uh, water, but no sewer to where you can dump your waste. Uh, so that's one she's talking about. It varies based on how much amenities are at the yes, spot. Yes, and that depends on the cost. Okay, so... On that, yes, you can stay in a Walmart parking lot. Yes, you can stay in a Cracker Barrel parking lot. Um, we even stayed at one time at a place called Harvest Host that you can be um, a part of. And that's basically free. You just go into their farm store or whatever the place is and you buy an item, right? So ours was like a $25 item. Yeah, so it's a pretty cool little creation. It'd be some farm that has maybe like a hobby farm. And they got a spot, a gravel area that an RV could park. And so they offer it to say, hey, you can come stay here. Don't pay us anything. You just 
we ask that you come into our little store and buy something, contribute in some way and leave it better than you found it. Kind of a Boy Scout motto, clean up after yourself. Yeah, so we stayed on a farm in Connecticut. It was honestly one of my favorite experiences. But here's what you need to know. I would not stay in one of those places more than two days if you have a family. Because here's the deal. You don't have hookups to anything at all. So you need to run your generator. And more than that, you need to um, your water tank. So like if you're going to take a shower, there's no place to dump, no sewer, nowhere to dump it. And so going to the bathroom, all that builds up. So what do you, you think about yeah, two yeah. days? So you have a fresh water tank. And especially with a family of four and showering, like this is like, uh, quick showers, washing the important areas and getting out. Um, that's still maybe, it's probably only two days. And then you have your gray tank and black tank. Black tank is the poo-poo and pee-pee. And then gray tank is like your uh, sink water and shower water and such. And those tanks filling up, which usually match kind of the water in your freshwater tank to an extent, um, there's a limitation on that when there's four people. Two people, if you're heading out as a couple, man, you're going to be able to go a whole lot longer as adults. You're going to be way more responsible with things. But kids, that they let stuff run a little bit longer. They're not minded to shut stuff off quick enough. Um, you've got to be thoughtful of that. That's why, I mean, transparently for me, what was my sweet spot and my support is pulling into an RV park that had full yep. hookups every night yep. because I could put my sewer line into a thing and completely empty my tank. So there's no smell coming into the rig and I can pick up fresh water. And um, usually too, we never, we didn't really like using our shower a whole lot because most of these RV parks had uh, bathhouses and that's where we'd rather get out. It just, you get out of the rig, you can go. Our bathroom was like for emergencies only. And we went and did that. But some people that love it are bigger rigs or nicer ones. They, they may be fine with that. Yeah, that's very true. We, some of them, like we had to, if it was a gross one, we had to use ours. Um, but what I do want to say is, talk, let's talk a little bit about the setup and teardown each night because that's the thing that can help you decide, okay, if you're going to go out west and you're going to go on this trip or wherever you're going to go, you need to decide how long do you want to be in an area, how much are you comfortable with um, doing a night or two here, and then let's move again and we're set it all up again and tear it down again. We did that, honestly. Two or three nights was probably the longest that we did. In the beginning, it feels like, oh my goodness, you know, we're setting all this stuff up. Couple couple stops down the road, we had it down to yeah. you, you know yeah, what you you're get doing. A habit, like a I know what pathway. I'm doing. The kids know what we're doing when it's a morning and we get up. And it just we would rather bounce around and be closer to what we were actually exploring. Now, some people stay in a place for a week and they'll drive within a couple hours of that and do it. And that's fine too. We just want to tell you the options and it's really not that bad setting up and breaking down and you figure it out very quickly. Remember, we had no experience. And I would say with that, uh, I do not want to do less than two nights so at a place. One night where I'm in, because usually you're, you can't check in, you're pulling and you set up and then that next morning you got to get out. It just... It's hard to find rest, especially after a long day. So usually, if I'm if I'm going to do a nine or twelve hour uh, drive, I want to be able to say, "Hey, the next day we're in the Jeep driving around locally, and at least for two nights, I'm not having to get behind that wheel and drive a whole bunch." Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more thing that I want to hit on that was a big thing that I didn't really know, and you wouldn't really know if you hadn't had this experience is let's talk about you've got your family and and food, okay? So obviously, your food cost is not really any more than it would be if you were at home, right? I mean, you're going to eat one way or the other. But here's what you need to consider. When you're looking at an RV, many of these RVs have small refrigerators, kind of a half-size refrigerator. Now, a lot of the pull-behinds don't, but I'm speaking from what we had. It was a small refrigerator, so it didn't hold a lot. Um, you also had to, like Brooks was saying, you didn't want to just leave it sitting there and not running. You had to cut it on because of or the fridge would suck your power, right? Yeah, so if you're hooked up to power outlets where this is big Mac Daddy extension cord, basically, that's running your rig and the power at all times, well, the fridge and everything can run okay. But if we were in some places where we were in a hotel for a couple nights because we wanted to experience a more urban environment and we wanted to be close. So we'd park the rig at a hotel and stay. I needed to go out every night and I would sit and read while the rig ran for probably 30 minutes to an hour. 
because it needed to make sure and recharge its house batteries. Because those house batteries, you just got to think about it. If that fridge is pulling at it at all times, keeping stuff frozen in the freezer, that battery runs out really quick. Yep. And so that was the one where we learned. We walk out and we have stuff. Carebeth has medicine that needs to be refrigerated. And I walk out and the fridge has not been running. And we have to throw away food. And it was like a sinking feeling. Right. Okay. So on that too, think about what you're doing when you're on these trips. So for us, many of the places we were going, like I remember being in Zion National Park, for example, and you're going out all day. And then when you're coming back, you have to think about cooking in an RV situation. So something that really helped us is we took um, standalone like burners, right? What would you call that? You, Yeah. You're talking about cooking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we had a I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not following what you're asking. <laughs> okay, so inside of our RV specifically, we had a little bitty kitchen area that did have a stove, but sometimes when we were cooking out or you're, you know, you're just making a full family meal, we would set up also our burners outside of the RV and we would cook stuff out there just too. Just camping stove mm-hmm. tops that you can have that right. we put in the back of the RV. No, I just wanted to mention that because that was helpful when you're coming home and you're trying to throw together a meal that doesn't take a really long time in a small space. We did use that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, And then talking about gas mileage, you know, the rig we were pulling because it was a, you know, it's it's a Class C. It's not a big, it's not a diesel. It's a front. The engines are in the front in the Class C's, Class A's. They call them diesel pushers because the diesel engines in the back, that's a a lot of power can get around easier. Mine with was gas powered, wasn't diesel, about five and a half miles to the gallon is what we got. I literally could almost watch that gas gauge go, and it's like, as Carrie Beth said, every day, and it's not a lie, like, I'm dead serious. The most joyful I would be is pulling out of a gas station with a full tank. It was like, oh my gosh, because I have the weight of my children and wife on me. We're out in roads. We don't know how far will it be before a gas station that I can get this rig navigating in and out. So having a full tank of gas and a full um, propane tank as well. Was super sweet. So propane's the other thing. Propane, you have to have propane to run those refrigerators, and so uh, and uh, cooking gas and everything. But while you're driving and you're running that fridge, the propane also is coming off of that too. So any pilot station, love station, the bigger rig places, you 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 don't notice it now as a normal civilian, but you do when you have that eyes looking for where. And there's a lot of apps too. There's some great apps that tell you where all those amenities are to be able to pull through and fill up propane. Fill uh, Also, some of them have dump stations too. Sometimes where I needed to dump, but we were going to a hotel that next night, I could pull through some of these larger gas stations and dump uh, the sewage out to make sure it was clean. Also, I would kind of say en route for the kids, hey, please, emergency number twos only in there and number ones preferably. And... Um, and they could flush the tank. Uh, we had a situation where our fresh water tank sprung a leak uh, three fourths of the way through the trip, so we had to have like jugs of water that we poured down in the toilet. But that's a little that's a little uh, kind of redneck. Uh, hopefully, when you're in that, you won't have to do that piece. So yeah, I mean, we've gotten down into the weeds on some numbers. Obviously, we can answer more individual que- questions if we need to. But these are just some of the things that would be really helpful to know if you wanted to plan an RV trip, right? So if you're doing this, what could you do right now to take steps? Start looking up availability. When do you have that you could go? What would it take for you to be able to go? Okay, so what are those things you need to put in place? Okay, now look up the areas you want to go and what's available there, right? (laughs) Find the RV. What type do you want? Um, But hopefully these things and these numbers and these ideas have, have given you um, kind of sparked that because in full disclosure, like we're not done with this. Yes, we had full intention, honestly, of selling our RV after that uh, that year because they just sit, it costs to store them, they rot, you know. Uh, but we look all the time at what our next step is and we love this. It taught us a ton. It gave us a ton of family time. And so my my biggest takeaway for you is if you're thinking about do it, doing it, do it because your kids aren't getting any younger. You're not getting any younger. And so if you can make it happen, start doing the research and make it happen. Yeah, Would you a, say? a couple of extras add-ons is there's always really nice people at these RV stops. And sometimes I'd have to say, hey, can somebody help guide me through this? Or Facebook groups that'll say, hey, you can ask a specific question to and they're going to give you information. So you, have, you won't know until you know, and you can't go 
to a school to learn this. You just have to go do it. And that's what you're saying. And another, some workarounds may be, there may be an option to where you fly into, say, Denver and you rent an RV because you may do the numbers and realize that having a payment on the RV, uh, all the run costs and upkeep and maintenance, because there were some maintenance items that we did that cost money. It may just be better uh, for those four weeks to just rent. It's really expensive, but you rent it for those four weeks and it's done and you return it uh, back to the owner. Maybe a good option for you. And it gets you out there quicker if you're more on a time crunch. Yeah. If you were just going to do like, if it's summertime and you're like, hey, we've got three or four weeks we can do buying one for that amount of time if you're not going to do a lot of trips yeah is a lot so maybe look into the rentals as well but yeah on the rv community brooks and i were walking around just a local one here recently and just kind of what like reminiscing on the fact of how great people are in the campgrounds and how we just kind of felt at home in there because it's just this like deep breath of being in nature and the joy of doing things on your own, but having this really great, friendly community yeah, around you. Yeah, it's good people. Uh, Matthew McConaughey writes in his book, Greenlight, about people in the RV community. And it's like sw- nice people and outlaws, basically, type of a thing. They won't bother you if you don't want to be bothered. But as soon as you pull your hood up, everybody in the campground is going to come help you. Uh, just good good-hearted people, our kind of folk, for sure, uh, that we enjoyed being around. So hopefully that's some insight. Again, as Carrie Best said, if you have questions, um, our Instagram handles should be here at the bottom of the screen for you, uh, for both me and and for Carrie Beth. Um, But if you're just listening, it is at the Brooks McDonald. Well, it's going to show. So it'll be, it's going to be right on the bottom of the screen for you to be able to see. So uh, you can, you can follow there and um, reach out and we love, please, if you liked it, Uh, Give us a like, give us a share um, so that more people can be hearing about us. So thank you for being with us. Hope you have a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye.